Happy Father's Day! Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in to Silver City Community Theatre Radio Hour. Sundays at 4, right here on Gila Membris Community Radio. KURU 89.1 FM, Silver City, New Mexico. And streaming online at gmcr.org. Hello, I am Wendy Spurgeon, your hostess here with weekly radio theater entertainment, meticulously edited by Chris Wellman of Mystic Way Productions, and featuring the fresh, locally sourced talent of Silver City Community Theater and beyond. As we continue to explore the golden age of radio, wow, we discover all kinds of historical scripts, transcripts that enrich, educate, and entertain us. And we are enjoying bringing these lost gems to light. We've got a great show for you today. Season 1, Episode 8. SCCT Radio Hour presents a really cool local father and daughter team. Dan and Ella Jameson star in The Enchanted Forest. And we also have the pilot episode of Father Knows Best. Pretty good uh, programming here for Father's Day. So let me share a little bit with you about the Enchanted Forest. So the Enchanted Forest is a scene from J.M. Barry's Dear Brutus. It originally aired on Fleshman's Yeast Hour on June 27th, 1935, starring Leslie Howard and his 10-year-old daughter, Leslie Ruth Howard as father and daughter, Will and Margaret Durth. So Leslie Howard is perhaps best remembered for his role as Ashley Wilkes in Gone with the Wind. That was his last American film. But he was uncomfortable with Hollywood and he returned to Britain to help with the Second World War effort. He starred in a number of Second World War films, including... 49th Parallel, Pimpernel Smith, and The First of the Few. That was uh, in 1942. It's known in in the U.S. as Spitfire. The latter two of which he also directed and co-produced. His friend and The First of the Few co-star David Niven said Howard was not what he seemed. He had the kind of distraught air that would make people want to mother him. Actually, he was about as naive as General Motors. Busy little brain, always going. In 1944, after his death, British exhibitors voted him the second most popular local star at the box office. And his daughter, Leslie Ruth Howard, said he was a remarkable man. So Howard married Ruth Evelyn Martin in March 1916 and their children, Ronald Winky and Leslie Ruth, Duty, who appeared with her father and David Niven in the film, The First of the Few, playing the role of nurse to David Niven's character, and was a major contributor in the filmed biography of her father, Leslie Howard, the man who gave a damn. In our SCCT Radio Hour homage, we were lucky to find a local father and daughter team, Dan and Ella Jameson, to take on the roles. And you are in for a treat. They are just excellent. And rounding out the cast is their wife and mother, Emily Aversa, as the host, making this a complete family project. It's been a true joy to work with the Aversa Jamesons, and the Enchanted Forest is Pure listening joy to start us off for our Father's Day episode of SECT Radio Hour. And without any further ado, enjoy the Enchanted Forest. Presenting now, Leslie Howard and his little daughter, Miss Leslie Ruth Howard, who is 10 years old. Mr. Howard and his daughter were with us six weeks ago. I think it's safe to say that no single performance since our variety series began has occasioned the volume of letters and telegrams of appreciation that followed their appearance then. Tonight, for the benefit of those of you who may have missed the first time and those who've requested a second hearing, 
we repeat the same scene from Mr. James M. Barry's fantasy, Dear Brutus. Leslie Howard and Leslie Ruth Howard in The Enchanted Forest from Dear Brutus. Mr. Howard will introduce the scene himself. Mr. Howard. Three things, they say, come not back to men or women. The spoken word, the past life, and the neglected opportunity. There is no second chance. Each road we take, each choice we make is done, and done forever. But suppose you could turn back the clock. Suppose there were a land of the second chance, an enchanted forest of might have been, a timeless place where the things you should have done are real, a land of the second chance. Can you imagine what that would be like? Go a step further, then, in imagination, with Sir James Barry and with me. Suppose I'm a man named Will Durth, an artist, a fashionable portrait painter. I'm in the middle years, and somewhere back in those years I took a wrong turning. I've become cynical in a rather shallow fashion. Dissolute, not quite a drunkard. My work has no sincerity in it, and I know it. My wife hates me. I despise her. I have no children. Once back there, I did want a child. How different things might have been, I think, if I had had that child. I'm standing now before a door that leads from my house to the garden. I walk through the door. Suddenly, I'm in a moonlit forest, a clearing drenched with moonlight. The house is gone, but I've forgotten there was a house. I'm sitting before an easel painting, and standing beside me in the moonlight is a little girl. I don't know now in the forest that this is my daughter that might have been. I only know that this is my daughter. The moon is rather pale tonight, isn't she? Comes of keeping late hours. I can't sleep when the moon's at full. She keeps calling to me to get up. Perhaps I'm her daughter, too. You look at tonight, you know. Do I? And can't you paint me into the picture as well as my mother? You could call it a mother and daughter. Or or simply two ladies, if the moon thinks that calling me her daughter would make her seem too old. Oh, matre pulcra filia pulcreor. That means... Oh, moon, more beautiful than any twopenny, halfpenny daughter. Daddy, do you really prefer her? Oh, she's not a patch on you. It's just the sort of thing we say to our sitters to keep them in a good humor. Margaret, what's this? It's a tear. I should think it is a tear. That boy at the farm did it. He kept calling snubs after me. But I got him down and kicked him in the stomach. He's a rather jolly boy. Yeah, he sounds it. You goth, what a night! What a moon! <laughs> Dad, she's not quite so fine as you've painted her. Shh, I've touched her up! It's too lovely, Daddy. I won't be able to keep hold of it. What is? The world, everything, and you, Daddy, most of all. Things that are too beautiful can't last. Now how on earth did you find that out? I don't know. Daddy, am I sometimes stranger than other people's daughters? Well, more of a madcap, perhaps. Do you think I'm sometimes too full of gladness? Well, my darling, you do sometimes run over with it. To be very gay, dearest dear, is to they so near to being very sad. How did you find that out, child? I don't know. From something in me that's afraid. Daddy, what is a might have been? A might have been? They're ghosts, Margaret. I dare say I might have been a great swell of a painter instead of this is uncommonly happy nobody. Or again, I might have been just a worthless, idle waster of a fellow. You? Well, who knows? Some little kink in me might have set me off on the wrong road. And that poor soul I might so easily have been might have had no Margaret. My word, I'm sorry for him. So am I. Poor old daddy, wandering about the world without me. Yes. And there are other might have beens. Lovely ones, but intangible. Shades, Margaret, made of sad folk's thoughts. Oh, I'm so glad I'm not a shade. How awful it would be, daddy, to wake up and find one wasn't alive. Yes, wouldn't it be? Daddy, wouldn't it be awful? I think men need daughters. Yes, yes, oh, they do, yes. Especially artists. Especially artists. Especially artists. Yes, especially artists. Fame is not everything. Fame is rot. Daughters are the thing. Daughters are the thing. Uh, daughters are the thing. I wonder if sons would be even nicer. No, no, not a patch on daughters. You see, the awful thing about a son is that never, never, at least from the day he goes to school, can you tell him that you rather like him. By the time he's ten, you can't even take him on your knee. No, sons are not worth having, Margaret. Signed, W. Durth. But if you were a mother, Dad, I dare say he would let you do it. You think so? I mean, when no one was looking. Oh. Sons are not so bad. Signed, Amder. Mm-hmm. 
But I'm glad you prefer daughters. At what age are we nicest, Daddy? Well, now, that's a poser. I think you were nicest when you were two and knew your alphabet up to G but fell over at H. No, 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 no. I think you were best when you were half past three. Or just before you struck six. Or possibly in the mumps year when I asked you in the early morning how you were and you said solemnly, I haven't tried yet. Did I? Yes, such was your answer. But I'm not sure the chicken pox doesn't beat the mumps. No, no, I'm all wrong. The nicest time in a father's life is the year before she puts up her hair. I suppose that is a splendid time. Mm. But there's a nicer year coming to you. Daddy, there is a nicer year coming to you. Is there, darling? Daddy, the year she does put up her hair. Puts it up forever? You know, I'm afraid that when the day for that comes, I shan't be able to stand it. My, it'll be too exciting. My poor heart, Margaret. No, no, it will be lucky you, for it isn't to be a bit like that. I'm going to be a girl one day and a woman the next for the first year. You'll never know which I am till you look down at my hair. And even then you won't know, for if it is down, I shall put it up. And if it's up, I shall put it down. And so my daddy will gradually get used to the idea. I see, but you've been thinking it out. I've been doing more than that. Oh, yes? Shut your eyes, Dad, and I shall give you a glimpse into the future. No, I don't know that I want that. The present's so good. Shut your eyes, please. No, no, Margaret. Please, Daddy. No. All right, all right. They're shut. Don't open them till I tell you. What finger am I holding up? Uh, the, uh, the dirty one. Daddy! Now I'm putting up my hair. I've got such a darling of a mirror. It's such a darling mirror I've got, Dad. Dad, don't look. I should tell you about it. It's a little pool of water. I wish we could take it home and hang it up. Of course, the moment my hair is up, there'll be other changes also. For instance, I shall talk quite different. Well, well, where are my matches, dear? Top pocket, waistcoat. You were meaning to frighten me just now. No, I'm just preparing you. You see, darling, I can't call you dad when my hair is up. I think I shall call you parent. Mm. Parent, dear, do you remember the days when your Margaret was a slip of a girl and sat on your knee? How foolish we were, parent, in those distant days. Oh, shut up, Margaret. Now I must be more distant to you, more like a boy who could not sit on your knee anymore. Well, now, now look here. I want to go on painting. Can I look now? I'm not quite sure that I want you to. It makes such a difference. Perhaps you won't know me. Even the pool is looking a little scared. Now look. Well, what do you think? Will I do? Stand still, dear. Let me look my fill. The Margaret that is to be. You'll see me often enough, Daddy. Like this, so you don't need to look your fill. You're looking as long as if this were to be the only time. Uh, oh, was I? Oh, surely it isn't to be that. Be gay, Dad. You'll be sick of Margaret with her hair up before you're done with her. Yes. Yes, I expect so. Shut up, Daddy. Daddy, I know what you're looking of, thinking of. You're thinking of what a handful she's going to be. Well, I guess she is. You think I'm pretty, don't you, Dad? Whatever other people say. Not so bad. I know I have nice ears. They're all right now, but I had, I had to work on them for months. You don't mean to say you did my ears? Yes, rather. Well, my dimple's my own. I'm glad you think so. I wore out the point of my little finger over that dimple. Even my dimple? Have I anything that is really mine? A bit of my nose or anything? Well, when you were a babe, you had a laugh that was all your own. Haven't I it now? No. It's gone. I'll tell you how it went. You see, we were fishing in a stream. That's to say I was wading and you were sitting on my shoulders holding the rod. We didn't catch anything. Somehow or other, I can't think how I did it. You, you irritated me. And I answered you sharply. I can't believe that. No, it sounds extraordinary, but I did. It gave you a shock, and for the moment the world no longer seemed a safe place to you. Your faith in me had always made it safe until then. You were suddenly, suddenly not even sure of your bread and butter, and a frightened tear came to your eyes. Well, I was in a nice state about it, I can tell you. Silly. <laughs> but what has that to do with my laugh, Daddy? Well, you see, the laugh that children are born with lasts just so long as they have perfect faith. And to think that it was I who robbed you of yours. Oh, how you do love me, Daddykins. Yes, I do, rather. You know, I, I never, never intend to lose you. It would be hard for me if you lost me, but it would be worse for you. I don't know how I know that, but I do know it. And what would you do without me, Daddy? No, no, no. Don't, don't talk like that, dear. It's wicked, stupid, naughty. Daddy, listen. It's going to rain.
Yes, I'm afraid it is. It frightens me, Daddy. Let's get out of the wood. Well, I'm afraid we won't have time, dear, before it begins to... Hello? I hadn't noticed there was a house over there. Look. Daddy, I feel sure that wasn't a house over there. Oh, silly. It's just because we didn't look our old way of letting the world go hang. So interested in ourselves. You know, it's funny. There's there's something vaguely familiar about that house. Let's get out of the wood. Yes, dear, yes. But there's there's somebody I have to see in that house. I'll just go in for a moment. I'll go with you, Daddy. No, no. You better not, Margaret. They, they might not care for children. Don't go into that house, Daddy. I don't know why it is, but I'm afraid of that house. No, nonsense, nonsense. There's a kiss for each moment until I come back. I'll be back before you can count a hundred. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Daddy, don't go into that house. Please, Daddy. Daddy, come back. I don't want to be... I might have been. Thank you. Beautiful work, Emily Aversa, Dan Jameson, and Ella Jameson. An extra special thanks to our audio engineer, Chris Wellman of Mystic Way Productions, for transforming our Zoom recordings into beautiful radio plays. We literally could not do the show without you. Thank you, Chris. If you're just tuning in, happy Father's Day. We just heard The Enchanted Forest on Silver City Community Theater Radio Hour, right here on Gila Members Community Radio, KURU 89.1 FM, and online at gmcr.org. A voice and a choice for Southwest New Mexico. Silver City Community Theater is a 501c3 nonprofit arts organization. Donations are made uh, tax deductible. They're very welcome. Just go to www.silvercitycommunitytheater.com. We are a community theater. SCCT is committed to promoting community theater opportunities for residents of Southwest New Mexico in all aspects of theater, stage work, publicity, acting, costuming. Our objective is to enrich, educate, and entertain with a vibrant range of live theater experiences year round. We hold open auditions for SCCT Radio Hour every Saturday over Zoom from 10 a.m. to noon through to the end of June. And they are easy, they are low stress, they are fun. For more information and the auditions registration link, link go to thewayoftruth.live slash radio. Next up, in keeping with our Father's Day theme, we are listening to the pilot episode of Father Knows Best. Father Knows Best premiered in autumn 1949 over the radio. Its time slot was 8.30 p.m. Eastern on Thursday nights. The show was sponsored by Maxwell House Coffee. It continued for five years until it transferred to to television. This particular script, however, was not one that occurred during the regular run of the program. Rather, it was an audition or pilot show. The networks would run these from time to time to see what kind of reaction they got from both listeners and critics. This Father Knows Best aired on Monday, December 20th, 1948. Since it was an audition, it ran without a commercial sponsor. On this version, Father Knows Best was about the Henderson family, not the Andersons as we came to know them. This was due to the fact that there was already a radio program called The Andersons. By the time the show started its own regular run, the family name had been changed to Anderson. The role of the father, Jim, was created with Robert Young in mind. He, of course, went on to do the TV role, then became Marcus Welby, MD. He also appeared in scores of movies, ranging from Hitchcock's Secret Agent to Northwest Passage to Sitting Pretty. 
The series began August 25th, 1949, set in the Midwest. It starred Robert Young as the general insurance agent, Jim Anderson. His wife, Margaret, was first portrayed by June Whitley and later by Jean Vanderpeel. The Anderson children were Betty, Rhoda Williams, Bud, Ted Donaldson, and Kathy, Norma Jean Nelson. Others in the cast were Eleanor Audley, Herb Vigren, and Sam Edwards. Sponsored through most of its run by General Foods, the series was heard Thursday evenings until March 25th, 1954. On the radio program, the character of Jim differs from the later television character. The radio Jim was far more sarcastic and shows he really rules over his family. Jim also calls his children names, something common on the radio, but lost in the TV series. For example, Jim says, what a bunch of stupid children I have. (laughs) Wow, sounds like my family growing up. (laughs) Anyway, Margaret is portrayed as the paragon of solid reason and patience, unless the plot called for her to act a bit off. For example, in a Halloween episode, Margaret cannot understand how a table floats in the air. But that is a rare exception. Betty, on radio, is portrayed as a status-seeking, boy-crazy teenage girl. To her, every little thing is the worst thing that could ever happen. Bud, on the radio, is portrayed as an all-American boy who always seems to need just a bit more money, though he gets $1.25 per week in allowance. Uh, So that's nearly $14 in 2021. So he is also... Bud is also in charge of having to answer the phone, which he hates. He is also shown to be a somewhat dim boy who takes everything literally. For example, Jim might say, go jump in a lake, to which Bud would reply, okay, dad, which lake should I jump into? And he also uses the phrase, holy cow, to express displeasure. On radio... Kathy is often portrayed as a source of irritation. She whines, she cries, and complains about her status in the family as being overlooked. She is often the source of money to her brother and sister, although she is in hawk several years on her own allowance. In an interview published in the magazine Films of the Golden Age in the fall of 2015, Young revealed about the radio program I never quite liked it because it had to have laughs, and I wanted a warm relationship show. When we moved to TV, I suggested an entirely new cast and different perspective. In our SECT Radio Hour homage to the pilot episode of Father Knows Best, we have Doug Abbott as the announcer, Robin Santa Teresa as the comedian's voice, Greg Jurette as father, Jim Anderson, Henderson, Shelley Chase as Margaret, Mia Riley as Kathy, Monty Valenzuela as Bud, Sarah Thrasher as Betty, and Sarah's partner, Billy Dominguez, as Betty's fiancé, Billy. That just worked out beautifully. He does a fabulous job. And rounding out the cast, we have William Knutonen and myself, as Billy's parents, Hector and Elizabeth. It's Father's Day, and we hope that you enjoy the pilot episode of Father Knows Best. Ladies and gentlemen, from time to time, radio programs of vastly individual, divergent types are presented to advertising agencies, sponsors, and the broadcasting networks, each of them striving to achieve a definite and conclusive effect. There is, for example, The Mystery Show. (laughs) Programs of this sort are presented for thrills, suspense, intrigue. Then there's The Comedy Show. 
Hey, Louie, here's one that'll kill you. Why did the chicken cross the aisle? You give up? Because it was a cross aisle chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Programs of this sort are presented for laughs, for rib tickling mirth, for genial good fellowship. The program you're about to hear, Father Knows Best, starring the eminent actor Mr. Robert Young, is presented for the next 30 minutes. In an average town, Springfield, on an average street, Maple, lives an average American family, the Hendersons. The husband, Jim, is very much in love with his wife, Margaret, and they're both quite fond of their three children, Betty, Bud, and Kathleen, which I should say is an average way for parents to feel. On this particular morning, which is an average sort of day, the Hendersons are ready for an average sort of meal, breakfast. Well, they're supposed to be ready, but you know how it is. The average mother calls. Jim, your breakfast is on the table. And the average answer is. Mother, I can't find my skates. Kathleen, come in and start your breakfast. Oh, breakfast. Don't you understand, mother? This is a crisis. How can I go to school without my skates? Eat your breakfast, dear, and we'll look for your skates later. Oh, but I have looked for them. I've looked just every place. They simply varnished. Vanished, Kathy. Did you look in the hall under the telephone table? Mother, that's practically the first place I looked. Well, how about the service porch? They aren't there. They aren't anywhere. Oh, what am I going to do? You're going to eat your breakfast. I'll run out to the garage and see if you left them there. And don't use too much sugar on your cereal. Look way in the back, Mother, near the magazine. Oatmeal? That's all we get around here is oatmeal. Ah! Never mind, Mother. Daddy found them. Who left those skates on the stairs? Good morning, Daddy dear. I want to speak to you, young lady. About what, Daddy? Skates, eh? How many times have I asked you not to leave your skates on the stairs? Oh, is that where they were? Oh, Oh golly. I looked simply everywhere and couldn't find them. Good morning, dear. Did you have a nice... Jim, what did you do to your chin? I came down the stairs on it. Let me see. Oh, Jim, your poor chin. Arr! Isn't it wonderful, Mother? Daddy fell down the stairs and found my skates. I did not fall down the stairs. Please, Jim, hold still. How can I fix your chin? I will not have that child telling people I fell down the stairs. I tripped over her confounded skates. Is that the only place she can find to leave them? Well, she's very sorry, dear. Aren't you, Kathy? Huh? Oh, sure. Um, Daddy. Not now, Kathy. Have some coffee, Jim. It'll make you feel better. Other people have children and they have skates. But other people have discipline in their homes, old-fashioned discipline, the kind of discipline we had in my home when I was a boy. There was a place for everything and everything in its place. Mom. Hey, Mom. I'm sorry, dear. We'll try to do better. What is it, bud? I can't find my other shoe. Where'd you put it? Look under the dresser. Okay. Is that where you generally put his other shoe? Sometimes. Hmm. How do you want your eggs this morning, dear? Oh, I don't care. Daddy, I was just wondering. Kathy, this is a very bad time to bother your father. We'd better let it go for a while. Uh, shall I scramble them, Jim? Yeah, that sounds good. But it's important, Mother. It's the most important thing in my life. What is? It's really nothing, dear. All right. Kathy, stop looking like Ingrid Bergman and tell me what it is. I need two dollars, Daddy. I'm desperate. Two dollars? What for? Wings. What did she say, Margaret? She said wings. That's what I thought. Why does she need wings? I have to be an angel. I told them I would. I just have to be. And they cost two dollars. It's the school play, dear. Kathleen said she'd be an angel. 
Well, I can certainly see they're not casting to type. Kathy, you get an allowance, don't you? If you can call it that. A quarter? Hmm. When I was nine years old, I had to work for every penny I got. I couldn't walk up to my father and say, I want two dollars for wings. Were you an angel? I certainly was not. Well, then you didn't need wings, but I promised I'd be an angel. All right, then find a way to sprout wings without my two dollars. Oh, uh, but Daddy, I'll just be ruined. Oh, Mother, can't you? We won't discuss it any further, Kathy. Your father knows best. Oh, how will I face them without wings? They were counting on me. Morning, everybody. How's what happened to the squirt? Oh, just a minor tragedy. Drink your orange juice, bud. Say, Dad, I was just thinking... Bud, not now. Let your father read the paper. But I was just going to tell... Not now, dear, please. But I have to. Gosh, how much time have I got left? You don't mind if I get in on this, do you? How much time for what? Well, Dad, we're going on a picnic tomorrow. A whole bunch of us. Fine. Have a good time. He can go on picnics, and I can't even have wings. You treat me like an orphan around here. Nobody even loves me. Oh, Kathy, stop being dramatic. Everyone loves you. Sure, but not two dollars worth. Kathy, your brother's not asking for two dollars. Your brother is not asking for anything. Yeah, except for permission to use the car. Except for permission to use... Except what? Well... Well, that's what I was going to ask you about. You see, we're we're all going out in the country, and I told everybody... You're not going to use the car. Oh, but Dad, if I don't, how am I going to go? You have a bicycle, haven't you? When I was your age, I was traveling all over the state on my bicycle. With a girl? How can I take a girl on a bicycle? Jim, I just thought that... One moment, Margaret. James Henderson, Jr., you are 15 years of age, and young men of 15 years of age do not go traipsing around the country with girls in my car. But everybody else does. Dad, I mean, they get to use their father's car. Joe Phillips gets to use his father's car, and he's two months younger than I am. I wouldn't care if he was three months younger and had wings. You may not have the car. Bud, you know your father doesn't approve of children driving automobiles. Children? If I want to use the car, I'm too young. If I want to go to the circus, I'm too old. I wish somebody around here would just tell me how old I am. We've decided you're too young. Now that will be all of that. I'll be an outcast. That's what I'll be. I'll be poisoned with every hunk of date bait in the school. Me and a bicycle. Bud, you'd better eat your eggs before they get ice cold. What a time to think about eggs. Dad, how'd it be if I... No. But I was just going... Uh, no. But you don't even know... No. Whatever it is, no. Oh, fine. Boy, I'm treated around here. You'd think I was an orphan. Copycat, I said that first. Quiet, squirt. Kathy, leave your brother alone and finish your milk. But I did say it first, didn't I, Daddy? I said it first and Bud heard me. And he is an old copycat. I am not. I wasn't even listening to you. You were too. You heard me say it. Then you said it. You're just an old copycat. I am not. You are so. I am not. You are so. Quiet. Both of you be quiet. Oh, Margaret, why can't we ever have a peaceful breakfast in this house? I'm sorry, dear. I don't think it's... Asking an awful lot. When I was a boy, we had wonderful breakfasts. Quiet breakfasts, peaceful breakfasts. We had respect for our elders. Sure, but you didn't have a kid sister, like the brat. I'm not a brat. You are a brat, if I ever saw one. I am not. You are so. I am not. You are so. Quiet. Good morning, mother. Good morning, father. What's the matter with her? I know. I was looking out the window at a bird. It was sitting on an egg. How could you ever tear yourself away? Dear Bud, such a lovable little moron. 
Betty, dear, you sound so strange this morning. Is anything wrong? Wrong? Oh, mother, how can you even say that? In this lovely, wonderful world, how could anything be wrong? Hey, Pop, you better hide your wallet. This one's going to be a pip. Father, if you don't do something about that child... Thank you. I believe I can manage my family without your assistance. Kathy? Yes, Daddy? As your father, I am quite capable of handling my own financial affairs. It may be a strain, but I can manage. Yes, Daddy. And I would prefer that even in moments of stress, you refrain from addressing me as, hey, Pop. Okay, Daddy. Finally, I believe that I am as well qualified as you to recognize the devious routes employed by your sister in leading up to the announcement that she needs a new dress. That's telling her, Pop. What? I mean, Daddy. You're all very amusing, but I don't need a new dress. Dear, are you sure you feel all right? I feel fine. Betty, you mean you don't want any money? No, Father, why? You don't want to borrow the car? Of course not. Well, (laughs) at least there's one sensible child in this family. Betty, I'm proud of you. Thank you, Father. Yes, sir. What this country needs is more children who leave their fathers alone at the breakfast table. I think I'll have another cup of coffee, Margaret. All right, dear. There you are. Thank you. Well, Betty, what's the good word in your little world? Oh, just the most wonderful thing has happened, Father. I'm going to be married. (coughs) Oh. Jim, hold your arms up over your head. Quickly, bud, pound your father on the back. Oh, what for? What happened? Don't stand there. Do something. Do you want him to choke to death? Jim. (coughs) I'm all right. I think. (coughs) You're going to be fine. Dad's just fine. (coughs) Well, stop beating me on the back or I'll never be all right. Oh, but but mother told me. I did not tell you to break your father's spine. But you told me to pound him. With your hand, not your books. Oh. Bud, you're going to be late for school. Yeah, I get it. Come on, Kathy. Come on where? You're going to school. I don't have to leave for 10 minutes. <laughs> That's what you think. Hey, stop pulling me, you brute. I have to get my things. Father. See you later, everybody. All right, Betty. Now, um... What was that newsy little item you dropped into the middle of my coffee? Hmm. Oh, you mean about getting married? Isn't it wonderful? Margaret, did you know anything about this? Not a word, Jim. I still don't. Betty, you're joking, aren't you? Joking? Mother, do you think I would joke about the most sacred thing in a woman's life? Jim, she isn't joking. Betty, you wouldn't mind giving us a little more information, would you? You know, just in case we want to get in touch with you later. I don't know what you mean, Father. Well, just for a start, who is it? Who's who? The boy. My prospective son-in-law. What's his name? Billy. He's wonderful. Oh, Betty. Not Billy Smith. Just wonderful. Which one is he? Oh, you know, Jim. The one who hates football players. The one Betty thinks is aesthetic. Aesthetic? (laughs) If it's the one I think it is, that's a new way of spelling anemic. Father, Billy is delicate. You have to be delicate if you have a beautiful soul. Well, that's exactly what this family needs. Somebody with a beautiful soul. Margaret, I have to get down to the office. Explain to Betty that she'll be happier if she waits. Make certain you know the usual woman-to-woman talk. All right, dear. Oh, you don't have to worry about us, Father. Billy and I talked it over all last night, and we both decided against a hasty marriage. We intend to wait. That's fine. I'll be home at the usual time, dear. All right, Jim. We're not going to be married until Saturday. If you... Saturday? Uh Uh-huh. Saturday night. We were going to make it in the afternoon, but we decided to go to the basketball game first. Jim, this is an emergency. Put your hat down. I'll put more than my hat down. Betty, this is the most ridiculous piece of conversation I have ever heard. Father, you mean you don't approve? Now that's the most intelligent remark you've made since you got up. I most decidedly don't approve.
But I don't understand. You've always liked Billy's father. You mean Hector Smith? Of course. I like Hector Smith. He's one of my best clients. Why don't you marry him? But he is married. Betty, your father and I have always thought to... Just a moment, Margaret. I'll handle this. Betty, you're 17 years of age. You're in your first year at the university. You will not marry Billy Smith or anyone else till after your graduation, and that's final. Graduation? But that's three and a half years. I'll be over 21. Why, why the best years of my life will be gone. Well, darling, we can always have Bud push you up to the altar in a wheelchair. You're laughing at me. I think you're horrid. You're just old-fashioned, both of you. You've forgotten what it is to be young and in love. You don't seem to understand that things are different now. Oh, Betty, nothing's any different. Things like that don't change. They do, too. Things change all the time. People change. Customs change. Everything changes. Only you won't admit it. Oh, darling, why don't you listen to your father? Things are no different now than when we were your age. The young people wore different clothes and they sang different songs, but fundamentally they were, they were the same. And even then, boys and girls didn't rush headlong into marriage, not until they were ready for it. You bet they didn't. They listened to their fathers. They were willing to benefit from a lifetime of experience. Why, when I was courting your mother, I was... Mother, how old were you when you married father? Well, I... Yes, mother? I was 17. But that was different. Why? Well, because things were different in those days. They, uh, people were different. The times were different. You said they weren't. Well, they were. Uh, some of them were, some of them weren't, and some of them were. Only the ones that weren't were more than the, uh, Margaret. Betty, uh, don't you think it would be a nice idea if Billy and his family were to have dinner with us tonight? Oh, mother, would you really? Margaret, I don't want the Smiths for dinner tonight or any other night. I think the idea of a dinner for the Smiths is not only ridiculous, but unnecessary. I forbid the marriage, and that's that. Oh, Jim, you know you like having people in for dinner. The Smiths are very pleasant, and you might be able to sell Hector some more insurance. Yeah, that's right. I might at that. But look, Margaret, I'm going to have a tough day at the office. I couldn't take a dinner tonight. Let's make it next week or next month. Dear, we can't put it off for even a day. I'll call the Smiths and see if they can make it. Shall I tell them that dinner will be at 7.30? 7.30? What's the matter with 6 o'clock? I'll be starved by 7.30. Jim, it just isn't done. Well, it's going to be done tonight. We'll have dinner at 6. I'll ask them to be prompt, dear, at 7.30. And mother, can we dress? I mean, can I wear my new dinner gown? Can I, Mother? Oh, please, can I? Betty, there will be no dressing for dinner. But, Father, I... Mother, please? I'm sorry, dear, but you know I never contradict your father. After all, your father knows best. It's been a long day for the Hendersons. The specter of a fair young child married and gone before her time has hung like a pall throughout the day. It would have, that is, if the Hendersons hadn't been so busy. Jim, you see, had a hectic day at the office. Six? Why, well, you robber, how about the two strokes you had in back of that tree? And don't tell me those snakes followed you over from the last hole. <clears throat> At the office. Bud has been involved in the intricacies of a higher education. But Margie, it's, it's helpful riding a bicycle. Well, look at all the fresh air you'll get and uh, beautiful muscles. We could even... Margie, hello? Margie, hello? Kathy has been involved in serious plans for the future. 
What do you mean they don't take girls in the Foreign Legion? I'll bet they do, especially without wings. Just wait, you'll see. Margaret, well, Margaret has been very busy cooking an extra special dinner for the Smiths. And if it's one thing Margaret can do, it's cook. Yes, sir, Margaret. If there's one thing you can do, it's cook. That's what I always say. You see, now we can proceed. Ah, proceed. Thank you, Hector. Do you care for another piece of pie? Margaret, please. I've already had two helpings. You've had three. Kathy. Um, how about another cup of coffee, Heck? Nothing like a cup of Margaret's piping hot coffee. Well, if you insist. Hector. I guess I better not. Jim, uh, you know how it is. Doctor's orders. Oh, sure. Well, how about you, Doctor, uh, Elizabeth? Thank you, no. One cup of coffee is quite sufficient. Well, I'm a two-cup man myself. You know, I was reading just the other day... Jim, it's not that we don't enjoy your informative little talks, but I was under the impression that this dinner had, well, should I say, a, a more or less definitive purpose? Hmm. Oh, you mean... Oh, sure. Absolutely. You know, I had a long talk with Heck before dinner. Jim, dear, I hate to interrupt, but uh, don't you think it would be a good idea if Bud took Kathy to the movies? In the middle of the week? I certainly do not. Oh, uh, I see what you mean. Uh, Bud, um, how'd you like to take Kathy to the movies? Oh, boy. I wouldn't. can't think of anything I'd rather do less. Well, that's fine. Here's a dollar. Have a good time. Ah, Dad, do I have to? Yes, you have to. That'll be enough of that, Kathy. Bud, I'm surprised. You ought to be glad to take your sister to the movies. I'd rather go with a gorilla. You don't know what she's like. She never even looks at the picture. She just sits around backwards and stares at people. They're funnier. I like to look at their faces. All right. Well, get going. Come home right after the show. If I'm still alive. Good night, everybody. Come on, squirt. Hey, stop pulling me. Why do you always have to pull me? Lovely children. They, they mean well, I think. Yes, Betty? Mother, Billy and I have been talking, and Billy, you tell them. We, we'd, uh, we'd, uh, would it be all right if we went to the movies? Oh, no, I should say not. We're here for a purpose, a very definite purpose. Yes, sir. We have a problem to discuss, and we're going to do it right now. Frankly, I think the whole thing is idiotic. Imagine discussing a ridiculous subject like marriage with these children. We're not children, Mother. We're quite adult. We have adult minds, adult bodies, adult passion. William! As I said before, Hector and I had a long talk just a while ago. Right, Heck? Right. And we're in complete agreement on the subject, right? Right. We both feel that open discussion is the only sensible procedure in a matter of this sort, right? Right. Hector, stop being so agreeable. Right. I uh, mean, yes, dear. Margaret, Elizabeth. Hector and I have agreed on what we consider a very sound solution to the entire problem. We have decided to permit Betty and Billy to be married immediately. Daddy! Daddy. Holy cow! I never heard anything so outrageous in my entire life! Hector, get your hat! William, we are leaving this instant! I'm not going, Mother. As soon as we- William! I'm 18, Mother. I've got a mind of my own. I love Betty, and we're going to get married. Well- I never! All right, now that's settled. You're going to be married. Oh, Mother, isn't it wonderful? I don't know. Yes, sir. Nothing like marriage and responsibility to set a man straight. Where do you kids figure on living? Right after you're married, I mean. Oh, well, uh, we sort of figured we'd move uh, in. Mother, couldn't Kathy move in with Bud? Then Billy and I could have her room and... That's ridiculous, Betty. 
you've got to have a home of your own, a place for your roots to take hold and grow. Right, Heck? Right. Well, gosh, that would be kind of expensive. And on my allowance... Oh, don't worry about your allowance, Billy. Married men don't go around taking allowances from their fathers. They don't? Of course not. They're too proud to be supported by their father. I'm not. Of course you are. You'll work. You'll sweat and slave. But you'll come home every week with a juicy pay envelope for your little wife. Isn't that sweet? But I, uh... (sighs) don't know how to do anything. That's not so. Poets make a living, and Mother, he writes the most beautiful poetry. I'm sure he does, dear. Recite the one about my hair. It's just wonderful. Aw, Betty. Well, it is. Raven tresses on a lofty brow, swept by the winds of time. Isn't that beautiful? Well, you could get a small house, a poet's size. Hey, Jim. I saw an apartment advertised the other day. It'll be just right for the kids. A uh, hundred and a quarter a month, furnished. Of course, that's without utilities. You know, gas, electricity, telephone. And food. Don't forget food. That's right. And laundry and cleaning. Oh, they won't have to worry about that, Jim. Don't you remember when we were first married? I did all our laundry and cleaning and cooking. I'm sure Betty would want to do that, do at least that for Billy, won't you, dear? I guess so. Uh, Betty? Yes, Billy? Can I talk to you for a moment, privately? Of course. Will you excuse us, please? We'll be right back. It's all right, kids. Take all the time you need. We're in no hurry. Are, uh, are they gone? I think so. (laughs) (laughs) Jim, we did it. Yes, sir. By golly, we did it. Oh, it was nothing, really. Jim, stop looking so smug. What was nothing? The psychological attack I planned for tonight. You see, I felt our wisest possible course, from a tactical standpoint, lay in a feint to the left flank and a drive through the middle. Do you follow me? Yes, dear. Right up to the part where you started to talk. Margaret, the whole thing is elemental. Yes, and very clever. We pretend to give our consent. That's the feint. Believe me, I almost did. Then we hit them with both barrels. The cost of living, the struggle for existence. They retire in disorder. Their armored units are smashed. Their rear guard is demolished. What a fight. Dear, dear, the enemy is back. Hmm? Oh, uh, uh, come on in, kids. Everything all settled? I think so, Father. Hmm, pretty much so. Sort of. That's fine. Now, um, what did you finally decide? You know very well what we were forced to decide. We have to wait. Why? Betty, I thought you, you and Billy. Mr. Smith, you don't have to continue the ridiculous performance you and my father were putting on. Betty... Oh, Father, you can be so juvenile at time, really. A hundred and a quarter a month. We know some kids who have one for 45. You older people ought to get straightened out on the simple facts of life before you start fooling around with psychology. Jim, your mouth is open. Well, um, now see here, both of you kids. Just a moment, Jim. Betty, exactly what do you and Billy intend to do? Well... As long as our families are determined to exercise parental prerogatives, we'll just have to wait until we're financially self-sufficient. Right, Billy? Right. Well, I never. Betty, about how long do you figure it's going to take you and Billy to um, become financially independent? Um, a few years. Well, <laughs> that gives us a little time to look around for a wedding present. Eh, heck? Yeah, that's right. Jim, a couple of years. That's a long time. A lot of things could happen. Uh Uh-huh. Hector, how about another cup of coffee? Oh, thank you, Margaret. I think I could use one. You know, Margaret, I'm very relieved. I'm so afraid of hasty marriages. Don't mind us, Mother. Just go on talking as if we weren't here. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. It's just that I was so afraid you were going to make the same mistake I did. Holy... Oh, I wouldn't say you made a mistake, Elizabeth. Heck's a pretty nice guy. Well, uh, thanks, Jim. You can send me a check in the morning. 
I suppose I have been fairly fortunate. But of course, people aren't always that lucky when they marry beneath them. I suppose not. When they... What? Eh, uh, Elizabeth? We'd better go. It's getting... Wait a minute, Hack. What was that crack you made, Elizabeth? Well, after all, my mother was a Stuyvesant, and I certainly... In other words, you think Betty isn't good enough for your son. I'm sure that isn't what Elizabeth meant, Jim. That's what she said. Well, isn't that what you said, Lizzie? <gasps> Don't you dare call me Lizzie! Why not? If you can say my daughter isn't good enough for that puny excuse of a son... Now, just hold it, Jim. Writing poetry. What makes you think he's such a bargain? My boy has a fine head on his shoulders. What shoulders? I've seen better heads on a small beer. Is that so? Yes, that's so. This is what comes from slumming. Slumming? Now you listen to me, Elizabeth Smith. Your mother may have been a Stuyvesant, but my father spent half his life picking your father out of the gutter. He wasn't lying down because he was tired. I think I'm going to faint. Hector, I'm going to faint. Uh, go ahead, dear. I'll catch you. You ought to be ashamed, upsetting my mother with your vulgar insinuations. Vulgar? Why, you little pipsqueak. If you were my son, I'd vulgar you so hard you wouldn't sit down for a week. Fortunately, I am not your son. Peasant. Peasant? Don't you dare call my father a peasant, Billy Smith. Don't you dare. That's what he is. He is not. He certainly is. Well, I'd rather be a peasant than a, a pipsqueak. Don't you call me a pipsqueak. I will if I want to, pipsqueak. Peasant. I never want to see you again as long as I live. Well, you won't if I can help it. You're just another... Hector! Uh, just a minute, dear. Say, Jim. I, um, I'm sorry I lost my temper, Heck. Say, Jim. That thing about picking Elizabeth's father out of the gutter, is uh, that true? Sure, it's true. Why? <laughs> oh, boy. Just wait till she pulls that Stuyvesant stuff on me again. Well, <clears throat> thanks for a lovely e evening, folks. Uh, come on, Lizzie. Yes, dear. And uh, Billy? Father. Come on, pipsqueak. Well, we started with breakfast, and we might as well finish the same way. Let's drop in at the Hendersons at breakfast time the very next morning. The average children are still getting dressed. The average mother is racing around the kitchen, and the average father... Jim, where are you going? Got a rush, dear. Can't stop for breakfast. Just time to catch the bus. The bus? But I thought you said... Never mind what I said. Just tell Bud if he gets one scratch on that car, I'll brain him. All right, dear. I'll be home at the usual time. Be a good girl. I'll try, dear. Oh, Jim. Eh? Uh, where did you leave the car keys? The keys? Oh, they're on the dresser, uh, on top of Kathy's two bucks. Jim. Now what's the matter? Remind me to tell you... You're an angel. I'm a dope. You are not. I've got witnesses. Well, why should I argue? After all, father knows best. Members of our cast are Robert Young as Jim Henderson, June Whitley as Margaret Henderson, Rhoda Williams as Betty, Ted Donaldson as Bud, Norma Jean Nielsen as Kathy. Robert Young will soon be seen in RKO's Baltimore Escapade. Ted Donaldson may be seen in Warner Brothers' Decision of Christopher Blake. Others in tonight's cast were Virginia Gordon and Sam Edwards. Music was written and conducted by Herb Vigren. Father Knows Best was conceived and written by Ed James. Entire production under the direction of Herb Sample. Bill Foreman speaking. Happy Father's Day! That was the pilot episode of Father Knows Best. Thank you, Doug, Robin, Greg, Shelley, Mia, Monty, Sarah, Billy, and William 
for sharing your time and talent with us. If you're just tuning in, this is Silver City Community Theater Radio Hour right here, Sundays at 4 on Gila Members Community Radio, KURU 89.1 FM, Silver City, New Mexico, and online at gmcr.org. I'm Wendy Spurgeon, your hostess here with weekly radio theater entertainment, meticulously edited by Chris Wellman of Mystic Way Productions and featuring the fresh, locally sourced talent of Silver City Community Theater. Please join us next Sunday at 4 for Episode 9, A Summer Romance Featuring Gay Rock, followed by another five-minute mystery, The Murder of Mrs. Brooks, and a haunting drama, Rendezvous with Tomorrow. Have a great week, ladies and gentlemen. Bye for now.